Legacy Refactoring. And my name is Lorraine Stain. Uh, my Twitter handle is LawCareRS, and I absolutely love it if people tweet, and that's a nice way to get feedback. So please, if you, if, if I say anything you like, please put it out there as a, as a tweet. As I said, I'm from Cape Town, and I'm the CEO of a software development company, one that we started over 30 years ago. So I've seen a lot of systems and a lot of legacy systems. Right. I have this fantastic role, which, which is, I suppose, how I built things for myself. But um, we've got about a dozen teams, and I get to join those teams and, and work with them, mentor, guide, train. Um, so I stay very hands-on. I'm not a manager at all. I'm still self-described nerd and software developer. And this is what I love doing. I just love code. But I guess none of us really love legacy systems. So let's talk a, bit about, a little bit about this and hopefully I can share some, some lessons. Do you get the, the vibe of, of legacy systems which says, here be dragons, that there is uh, something to be really scared of? And unfortunately, that is, I think, how a lot of people see it. And I maybe need to give my own definition of, of legacy, but you know, almost the moment you check code into the vault, it becomes legacy. It's, it's done. So we spend much more of our time maintaining code than we do writing it from scratch. That is my experience. So we should find better ways to do it, right? The general definition of legacy code is basically something that somebody else has code. It's something we don't really want to engage with. And I think that is actually a formal definition, somebody else's code. I don't really agree with that entirely. But maybe we know in our gut when it's legacy. You can ask almost any developer and they'll say, I don't want to touch that stuff. And that's a pretty clear indication that it's a type of legacy. The, the other definition is, it's not safe to touch. We're, we're actually scared of this code. Almost everything we do, we, we end up burning our fingers. So we can talk about how we can make it safer to, to change. This is a real connection. It's a mess of electrical wires. And it for me sums up what happens to code. I mean, it starts off fine, right? It, it starts off as you know, we will start off with the best intentions and over time it becomes this terrible, terrible mess. And the thing is it works. So you're too scared to start pulling it apart because it works. There's business value in there. The business needs it. Well, why does it always become such a mess? Uh, the domain-driven design people have a name for it. They talk about a big ball of mud. So I'll, I'll, I'll probably use that term most of the time, the big ball of mud. And the thing about the big ball of mud is that it's, it's almost inevitable. I used the avalanche picture to, to indicate this, but it's almost like you have this weight and it's going to start rolling and it's just going to become a mess. I think it's uh, in the foreword to the Working Efficiently with Legacy Code book by Michael Feathers, which you know is a, is a good place to start if you're looking for tips. But it's, it, it agrees with me. It says it's inevitable that it becomes a mess. So that's pretty sad. Before I talk about how we deal with that mess, let's have a, a brief moment to just talk about how much we all love shiny new toys. And if there's one thing that developers love is shiny new toys. Because of this urge, there'll be as much debate about whether we should rewrite the system as whether we should refactor it. Again, I have views that's from our experience, you know, over 30 years of systems, that you only rewrite if the functionality of the business has changed so much, the requirements of the business has changed so much that there's not no value left in the code. But while the business is still fundamentally the same, you know, moving forward, but fundamentally the same, you should refactor and not rewrite. 
I will go into that and why a little bit more, but that's not the focus. We look at legacy, and we have a lot that does actually work. In fact, fundamentally, it works. Against that, we have our problem areas. So we've got to be careful not to let a smallish amount of problems sort of took the scale as such, so that we think everything is a problem. It's also one of the reasons why the rewrite doesn't so often goes wrong, is people focus on their problems. So you get your new, new system emerges months, years later, and it's focused on the problems and the things that used to work now aren't, aren't well sorted. So you've got to keep on remembering that there are so many things in that mess, in that legacy. It's taken a lot of time for people to put all those little tweaks in, the things the users love, the button that just does their job more. Right? And, and that brings me to another point about legacy. In every domain, except for coding, legacy is a good thing. If you talk about leaving a legacy to somebody, that is desirable. That is a really good thing. And we have to get back to that sense of value when we talk about legacy systems. We have to remember that they represent enormous business value. We may hate the code, but we mustn't hate the value of what they deliver. Cool. So how do I recommend tackling this? How do I fight my dragons? I recommend looking at this kind of triangle. At its base, at the base we have tools and infrastructure. In the next layer, we have to deal with the people and the team and their skills. And only at the end of it all will we look at code. Okay. So let's start off by what do I mean by tools and infrastructure. You'll have to look at this picture and imagine that uh, this biplane is maybe uh, the engine's getting old, it's, it's spilling a bit of oil, um, it's probably just smoke. But, but hey, let's imagine so we, we can see an old plane. Imagine your system is a little bit like this. It's working, but everything's a little bit old. I find so often when I look at legacy systems that people have allowed the environment to get old as well. So they're not on the latest versions of Visual Studio. Maybe not using the latest version of C Sharp, if that's your tool. Very often on old databases. Um, I can give an example of a system we've dealt with recently that was still in SQL Server 2008. Now that was an easy discussion to have with the, the client because that's actually deprecated. It's not even good business value to continue on it. So what we recommend is a very first step is to get all your tools up to date. Okay? It's usually fairly e easy to have those discussions with your, your users, your clients, whoever they are, that say it's not good business sense to be using old tools, there's security problems, it's deprecated, support's bad. So what we recommend is that you find everything and you get it up to the most current version you can. I know sometimes there are libraries and their dependencies that mean we can't totally modernize everything, but take all the, I mean, these are quite cheap upgrades. Do as many of these standard updates as, and as far as you can. Convince your client to go for Azure if you can, or you know, take it up as, as up to date as you can. There's another bunch of things that I throw into this base of infrastructure. And that is this code that was never good. It's not like it was even good in its day. There's something about legacy systems that so often I find the most terrible architectural decisions have been made. You look at it and you have these absolute WTF moments. You're saying, who thought this was a good idea? And it's driven by a lot of things. Um, usually with great enthusiasm, many, many years ago, some team decided to write their own framework. Now, if that doesn't send uh, shivers into your, your spine, I don't know what does, because handwritten frameworks, they usually just get in the way. They're not 
as good an idea as, as they seemed when you thought you were going to get the system to be so clever. The lucky thing with software, of course, is that if we remove these pillars that are in our doorway, these, these big, bad architectural decisions, we don't have a roof that falls down on us. You know, software is malleable. It's something you can change. So I really recommend that you have a look if there are any architectural decisions that were taken that are getting in the way every single day. And it can be, as an example, um, a system we worked with had a multi-tier architecture implemented, but it didn't need it. And that's, a, that's can, you know, it could be an architecture which is, is good for other purposes, but it wasn't useful there. In this architecture, we had a front end, a middleware layer, and a back end which meant you had to do everything three times. In terms of supportability, it was a nightmare. I mean, just everything took longer. And you sometimes have to be quite creative to figure out how you can remove something like a middleware layer without breaking everything. But if you can do it, you just set yourself up for your next stages to be so much more successful. And in modern terminology, we could probably find quite a few implementations of things like microservices that probably shouldn't have been, and I'm sure you have a whole host of examples yourself. So how do you identify these things? And um, here we must maybe talk about who am I speaking to? I'm in the lucky position that when I come into a team or and I'm, I, we take on a job and we look at an old system that we're going to help support and help move it forward, we have the authority to make changes. Sometimes, the, and most times, the team who's been in place have at least felt that they didn't have the authority to make any changes, but they always know what their problems are. So the way you find out what's really wrong, of course, is you trust your people, you trust your developers, what's getting in their way every single day, and then you Tell them that we are actually going to let you fix it, which is such an amazing step, right, when you feel disempowered. And along those lines, let's talk as well about, about motivation of people. When you start making upgrades, you bring software up to date, you allow teams to fix things that have been hurting forever, and they start to believe but management really cares. Ah, this isn't just the old system in the back room and nobody cares. Somebody cares. Things are going to get better. I'm not just doing a, day, a job day in and day out with the soul destroying. So you, you can motivate people. You can raise morale. You can have some wins, which is also a really great place to kick off the next stages of the refactoring and, and cleaning up a legacy system. Start with a win, right? So it's, it's a little mix of things. It's not that clearly defined, so, but that's the tools and infrastructure. And I do believe that unless you have a base that you can build on, and you're going to just waste an awful lot of time. So deal with those big things. Get a nice solid base, so a newer one, get your tools up to date. And then we can talk about the next most important thing in refactoring any system. And it's your people, right? It's the people that are going to do the work. Yeah, there's a deep and sad truth that the team who made the mess can seldom fix it on their own. Over many months, many years, the team has dug their particular hole and they need help to get out of it. There's another small thing there about the rewrite as well. If you have a team and they've begged and pleaded and management has agreed to allow a rewrite, unless that team learns some new skills, if, they, if the same team tackles the rewrite, you're going to get the same result over time, which is a legacy system, which is a tangled mess, and degenerates into a big ball of mud. I promise you, you will get that. You also can't just bring in new, a new team. 
because they don't have the domain knowledge. So although the Costa Concordia's captain probably has never had another job driving a ship, we do to ships, in software it's not quite so straightforward. We need the team that's currently in charge of that legacy software because they have the domain knowledge. And unless you have a very unique situation of a very well-documented uh, legacy system, it's actually usually more, uh, you know, here be dragons. There's bits of the code where no one wants to go and no one knows it. So you need the domain knowledge to be preserved. So we have to take the team in place and we have to raise the bar. We have to increase and upskill, increase their skills. So what kind of skills, you know, what am I talking about here? I usually look at, at extreme programming for the techniques that we need to bring into teams. And it would be the, the two techniques that are most valuable are obviously the unit testing or TDD, if you can get all the way there, but at least unit tests and pair programming. And before I go any further, I just want to say that when you start working with a team and we're doing this refactor, the team is often expecting, they know it's not a good job, right? And if you turn it into a blame game, you just get people who are sullen, they, they're resigning, they don't want to work with you. So when you talk about upskilling people, it's very important that it's not a blame game. It's very important that it's talked about as a growth opportunity, that you want to bring the whole team with on this journey to making the software a little more beautiful. So let's go and have a look at the first of the techniques, which is unit tests. I mean, bluntly put, we need a safety net. And without a safety net, which is your tests, any changes you make, any refactoring you do is very, very risky. Yeah, I'm going to refer back again to Michael Feather's book. Uh, he actually defines legacy systems as systems with no, without tests. Now, I don't think it's quite as simple as that because I've actually seen systems that have tests, but the tests are useless. So let's define it as systems that have useful domain level tests. That's where we want to get to. Again, I'm, I'm giving our opinions, but this, and this isn't a talk about testing because we can get into all of the deep dives there. But what I value most is tests that test business logic. Tests that, that basically prevent me as the developer on the team from constantly shooting myself in the foot, right? So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the kind of tests that, that protect us. And usually it is quite difficult to, to know how to write these when you haven't been experienced in it. So there's a lot of, of mentoring as well, you know, as well as the upskilling and maybe some workshops, you, you have to figure out ways to actually do this kind of upskilling. The other technique that I really, really love is pair programming. So our own teams um, have been doing pair programming for a long, long time. It, it's obviously a great way to pass knowledge around and, and all this. But obviously in the last year with COVID, we went fully remote as a company. So all the developers now work remotely. And for me, the pairing has become a lifeline. Right? It's my connection with a fellow human being, even if through my screen. It's somebody that I can talk to about design decisions, somebody I can learn from, I can share knowledge with. It's even something, so pairing helps me stay on track. So instead of spending another hour in the morning in my pajamas, because I'm working from home, I'll be thinking that my, my pair person is waiting for me. And then, you know, it really helps to formalize my day and um, helps me personally to do better work. And what I love about remote pairing, it's, it's even better than person, you know, in-person in pairing was because I don't have anyone in my space. I don't have to physically share my screen and keyboard. We're sharing it electronically now, digitally. So I've got no one in my space, which as an introvert, that really works for me. And, uh, and now it's only my, 
real asshole cat you know, who's, who's in my space usually on, on, on the keyboard. Now, paid programming is a really great way to bring good habits into a demotivated team. So if you can, if you're bringing extra skills into the team and you've got people who may be slightly better coding habits, they know how to do tests properly, if you can bring those skills in and you pair somebody with higher tech skills, with a pair, you make a pair with somebody who's got high domain knowledge, that's actually a great way for the one to teach the other. You need the domain knowledge and you need the technical skills. So I find that to be a very effective pairing. Tech and domain together. Again, this is not a pair programming talk, but um, you should know the rules. You never put juniors together. Yeah, it's not just a learning environment. It needs to be a productive one where you're sparking ideas and coming up with better designs. So we have to change habits. Remember, this is we're only talking about this in the context of code that has become legacy, it's become a mess. And usually that has happened because of work pressure. Business has been saying we need these changes. The developers are, it's, it's an uphill slog, right? I mean, the code's ugly, you're working your butt off to get it done and you're coding. So you jump in there and you code. And we want to stop that. We want to get people to step back from that code and start thinking about alternatives, other ways we can tackle it. So we've got to change some big habits. If you're working in an agile environment, you know, and using something like Scrum, start making sure that those SP2s are happening and that they're effective. You, whatever you do, you need to make sure that we, we're holding those design discussions. So something again that we like to drive is that part of the design session is explicitly coming up with alternatives, not just coming up with the first solution and then implementing it, but actually spending the time to say, how else could we do this? Because you have to think about this, this enormous legacy code base in front of you as kind of a big ship that you can't just turn around. And if you don't start changing habits, people are gonna continue coding in the style that they always have. The style that brought us to the mess because that's what's in front of them. So yeah, the, the biggest thing right, in, right now is to start changing habits before you're actually gonna have success. So you might do a bit of refactoring, you might improve things, you go away and it just reverts to the big ball of mud unless the habits have changed. So, so that's why the people and the skills so important. Now finally, now finally we can talk about code. The Boy Scouts rule is the idea that you should always leave what well, applied to code in your head, but you always leave your code cleaner than you found it. So whatever you checked out, you check it back in cleaner than you found it. Again, you can you don't have to say it has to be totally clean. They, they talk about don't let uh, good be the or better be the enemy of best. You know, at least better is fine. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be better. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And here, here's a nice way to think about, about the job. And these little diagrams are taken from our own Jeffrey's blog. And I really like this approach to refactoring code. You know, when you start out, for every job you work, point from A to B is very straightforward. You can work through the code, you know what you have to do. The lines don't cross very much. After a little while, you can think of the little squiggles as like bushes, a little bit of brush that's getting in the way. And these bushes are going to get they tend to get more and more. We talk about tech debt. It's messy bits that you almost have to work your way around in the code. And they multiply. They multiply over time, right? And at some point, they get so dense that you almost can't get through the code anymore. And this is the point where 
if, if not before, you now have to refactor. And ideally, you want to do it from that second one. But if, if you can refactor at the point where you're working on something, so this little diagram has five touch points through the, the tech data areas. And if you clean up just enough to do the job that you're, you have in hand, you've left things cleaner. It's worth also at this point just mentioning that this is, for me, the only way to do it. You, you shouldn't, that, that idea that you can put tech data onto your backlog, onto your board, that you can go and ask management, can we have three months off to handle tech debt? First of all, you almost never get it. And, and secondly, then you will work on maybe some of those bushes on the, the top left there, which don't matter right now. It, it's not the area where we're having to make changes. So I'm fairly against generic tech debt cleanup sprints or pushes. And, and, and think that you should really just clean up where you're working. And then the way this works is the next time, the next job you get, you're gonna clean up a little more. And at some point you hit that magical point where something you're working on, you end up going through code that's already been cleaned up. And sure, you could polish it up a little more, but you start finding that you speed up. So the orange line gets to benefit from a previously cleaned part and the team will feel better because they're starting to see yeah, it doesn't take as long as it used to, right? Things are speeding up. Yeah, run Jeffrey's blog. It really is the best approach to doing this. There's something called the legacy code dilemma. So we've talked about having tests in place as a safety net. But a lot of code is not testable. So we need, in order to put tests in place, we first have to change code. We're saying we shouldn't change code with our tests. All right. We recently have to deal with this. The, the way that we recommend you, you consider doing it is that you clean first. You know, if you were doing an operation, you would first clean the, the area and then you do the operation. And just like that, when you, you first do the refactoring, and refactoring by definition means the output of the code must still be the same, right? You must still deliver the same result, even if the way the code is written has changed. So in refactoring, we do that exercise first. We would normally recommend you would, you know, you make a branch, you check that out, you make those changes. If the, you do use a pull request mechanism, if someone approves it, it goes back and gets merged into your master, and only then do you apply the change that the business wants. So you, split, you separate those two steps very clearly so that you can test that you've got the same functionality as before, before you may start making functionality changes. And then in the pull request, um, one of the things you can do with the vault, of course, is you can enforce your rules that you don't accept the code back in unless it has tests. So you can start bringing in that rigor, which says there need to be unit level tests available at a domain level for each piece of code that's getting put back in. So you're improving things. You're actually enforcing the good rules and you're creating a nice safe environment in small steps for the team to engage with the code and get it better and better. Cool. So what kind of refactoring are we encouraging? The main thing is we are trying to reduce the interdependencies, really. I mean, it's fancy words for it, the law of Demeter. Low coupling. We want to reduce the number of connections. The more connections you have, the more trouble, right? That's the, that is when you change something here and three things break down downstream. So whatever you do, you're trying to reduce coupling. It's a, some... some Techniques, of course, like things like single responsibility uh, principle, SRP. That's a great, great way to do it, where you start taking individual small testable pieces out of what's often ugly long methods. Make sure you've got tests to cover them and they have all their dependencies as parameters 
and a clear output, no side effects, all those kind of things. Of course, if you are lucky enough to have a JetBrains reshopper license, you don't even have an excuse not to be doing this. It makes it so simple. You know, extract method is like, it's like a candy, I think, in refactoring. It's, it's, it's the easiest thing to use. It's so clever at working out dependencies, getting the arguments right, and putting it all together for you that it's literally just, you know, your, your fast key to extract method. And I know there's support in Visual Studio, but it's not as good. Cool. The other part of it is having extracted all these little testable methods is finding the right home for them. Where should they go? So this is considered cohesion, which is keeping associated things together. Now, we like to use domain-driven design as one of the ways to, to group things. So you group things by, by business domain. So methods that have to do with the customer go together, methods that have to do with stock management go together. You use the domain to, to group things together. But it doesn't really matter, right? I am not saying you have to go any particular way. What you have to do as a team is communicate and agree what your structure is so that everybody knows where to find things. The thing is, if you extract a lot of methods and the rest of your team don't know they exist and can't find them, and they're not well named, they're never going to get any reuse. And reusability is also one of the, the real goals because should, you know, again, legacy systems, for some reason, everybody has just been like control C, control V crazy. There's usually so much copied code. So you've got to also change that habit and you've got to get people to be able to find methods and reuse them. I guess this is a good time to talk about domain-driven design a little bit more. So domain-driven design is, it's so many principles and it's a fantastic way of structuring your approach to code, but it's really hard. And also it doesn't actually suit every domain. I mean, they talk about, you know, any critical domains. There's a certain amount of things just don't need this extra level of complexity. But there are still techniques that you should be borrowing from DDD. And, and the one for me that's really, really absolutely core cool is ubiquitous language. And this is the idea that you use the same terminology for, for a concept. So you use the same terminology that the client uses, the business domain. That's what you use in the code, in the tests. So when you speak about something, there's no misunderstanding about what it is. Everyone is using the same language. And along with that, while you're refactoring, please remember that names really matter. Uh, you know, I don't know, we think that naming is easy, but it's not easy. Figuring out what to call something is, is absolutely so core. You know, that's how somebody else will find it again, right? So use the language of your users and avoid computer jargon. If you take nothing else away from domain-driven design, that's the lesson. Layering is also something that we need to talk about. And you can have too many layers and you can have not enough layers. I rather like this. It must be supper time. It looks good. So let's talk about the two few. That, that one we see a lot is you'll find a web controller and they've written the entire system into the controller method. No, no, we need to pull it out into small testable bits, organize it behind that. Or huge methods inside an event handler. I think you would know that these are, are not good things and you need to be extracting methods. But the, the opposite is also true. You find systems where it's seven calls deep before you actually get to the piece of code that does the work. And especially when you're trying to refactor, you're trying to get rid of dependence on globals, a seven level deep code often is dependent on some global and some state that you didn't know. So you're trying to extract all of those things and, and, and make sure that you've got no side effects, that it's obvious what's getting passed in. And then you end up doing something where you have to pass the same parameters down each level 
this has got to get to the point where it's needed. So cleaning up levels and layers where you can, simplifying, asking yourself if this layer is serving any purpose. If all it's doing is passing it from there to there, it may not be serving a purpose. And having those design discussions and, and making sure that your layering is, is serving you. I'm not saying there's any one that's right. Although, you know, we really like to have um, front end code separated from domain code separated from persistence. Those are some fairly obvious things, I think. Often in legacy systems, it's all mixed up in that one big tangled mess in the ball of mud. So we can also talk about boundaries. A lot of refactoring talks, and I've watched some demos as well, and somebody shows you how you extract and create a bounded context. And, and it's absolutely the thing you should aim for. But when you have a tangled mess, it turns out that it's very difficult to pull sometimes. Now again, we're just saying, we're not gonna let best be the enemy, you know, here we, we will just take better. So sometimes pulling on a piece of code, it's, it's like you're gonna unravel Jersey. So the boundaries are very important, but sometimes very hard to retrofit. So just cleaning up what you have and even if it remains a monolith, is a legitimate strategy. Not as beautiful as if you were able to create a more modularized and bounded context solution. But you know, we're working with old code here. So I'm just going to put that out there that if the tendency of all code is to turn into a monolith, sometimes it's too dangerous to pull on the, the string in the jersey. Oh, I do have one suggestion though for modularizing. Um, it can be justified to create a, a clean, new sort of parallel set of classes and methods. So one of the approaches you can take is that you, you don't do a whole lot of refactoring on the old methods, but you start a new class structure almost in parallel. And as you extend that, you move the code that is dependent on it over from the messy calls it used to do to the new parallel cleaned up, nicely designed solution. And, that, and that's, that's quite nice. It does mean you end up with two copies, so you, you've got to watch that and you have to then have an actual commitment to kind of move logic from the one to the other as you go. But it can give you a nice way to, to just put something in nice and clean and not actually deal with the big ball of mud. So these are the things from a code point of view that we really feel are, are vital. We need to teach people what is clean code. Right, there are various books and clean code is not the only one. Um, Remember the, um, the other one, I'll, I'll, I'll put some references up later. There are actually a lot of good principles around clean code and you need to teach your team, whether it's by mentoring, whether it's by showing them, pairing, how to do a better job of cleaning up the code. You need to spend time on naming and try and get to some point of ubiquitous naming if you possibly can. You need to chase down things like globals and kill them. I've talked about single responsibility principle. It's a little harder than it looks. Uh, you know, if you take it to its extreme, every single line could be a single responsibility. So you need to, to really come up with something that fits your domain, which says, what is the logical single responsibility? You know, talking in code steps. It needs to be Again, you still need to keep code together that needs to be together. So I've seen teams mess that up as well, as simple as it sounds. You need to be extracting testable methods. There are so many things in, in, in what do we mean by testable. And for me, mostly it means it's domain tests. I have a pet hate, which is testing persistence. I've been to see the comments afterwards and maybe you're all going to kill me and say, no, no, you test everything. But I don't believe in, in, in test coverage per se. 
it really does nothing for me. I mean, honestly, I believe that my database will save this thing if I give it to it. If I give you a packet of data, I trust the packet of data will be saved. So <laughs> I'm quite anti persistence level tests. I love domain tests. What is the logic? What is it that if we missed something and you know sent in a null that it would break or we sent in the wrong sign and the, the accounts were all thrown out? Test for those things. That matters. As part of motivating people, uh, encourage the use of new features. If you have to do little workshops on you know the latest features, because the old code would have been written in an old style. So you start working with the C sharp code base and Link is like, oh, wow, you know, new stuff. So, you know, you, you've got to work through this and teach the team and bring them along on the journey. There have been some lovely sessions today. I just finished listening to uh, all the C Sharp 8 stuff. Yeah, it's, it's always changing, right? So you, it's the people you have to change if you want to see the code change. Tighten up scope, you know, get rid of the globals. Those are some of the hints that we can give you. The other thing about legacy systems is there's usually too much code. You know, so imagine this is hundreds of thousands of lines of code often. And it's just so difficult to get through it. And you need to put that code on diet, essentially. What we find quite useful, and again, it can't be done as a management stick, right? But metrics are useful if they're owned by the team. I don't like lines of code metrics if some manager is going to come down and think that lines of code are a good thing. This particular metric, I want you to do it in reverse. Make a little game with your team, which says, how many lines of code did we get rid of this week? Every week, celebrate any wins. Because I promise you, in that legacy mess, there's a lot of duplication. There always is. So as you clean it up, as you get back to more ubiquitous language as you extract methods, you should actually be slimming the code down, not bloating it further. Now, even to, to really add a little bit extra, count your tests as well and still try and reduce the lines of code. Because what you want to build is you want to build a habit and an enthusiasm for, oh my goodness, I found this terrible piece of code. I was able to delete almost all of it because it was deprecated, I don't know, no longer used. Do you know how much code is in execution paths that is never actually traversed? Things are built because, you know, the, the spec was this enormous spec. And later on, when you look at it, it turns out no one's ever looked at this report. That kind of transaction doesn't happen anymore. I and mean, I'm talking very really businessy systems, but I'm sure it works in all sorts of domains. So yeah, I played this game of, um, Put the code on diet and see how many lines of code you can get rid of every sprint. If you do all of those things, I really believe you will get back to why we all became programmers. I did it for the sheer joy of making things, for the beauty of writing some code and seeing it work. And it is a great pity when you can't have that sensation every day of your, your career. But this was fun. We got to make things better. So you want to bring that in. And I hope I've given you a, a track, a, a way, a route to making it possible. So that's it from me. Go forth and uh, tame your dragons. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lorraine. That's awesome. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Keep the button fast. at the same time. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. As, as has been mentioned in the comments there, there was a lot of wisdom in that talk there. We're, we're all sitting here kind of nodding furiously behind the scenes here, just saying that that's just, uh, there's some, some great stuff going on in there. Um, very much I appreciate that. I think I counted wisdom like three times, two times in the chat, <laughs> once, in the, uh, once on Twitter. It's all this gray here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope it's catching. <laughs> That's all I can say. But any you know, questions? Obviously, I can't look at that when I'm inside.
I also <laughs> have a bit of gray hair, but uh, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm wise. Any, anyway, one, one thing I want to I want to say is initially you, I was already saw saw it because when you brought that analogy of avalanches in, that was really great because I thought like big ball of mud sounds if you think about it it sounds like something you can work around you can just walk around it and be done but avalanche it's more like a something like a ticking time bomb that you don't expect and it may come at any point you know when you already have planned certain sort of to add new features and then suddenly it goes boom and you can't really do anything about it yeah, i so also like was, if you don't mind, um, i like the idea that it, it keeps growing okay so in my mind, that, that ball is, is like the, the snow and it gathers everything up until it's all just more and more of a mess. And keeping pieces out of it is, is a real trick. That's true, yeah. And trying mm -hmm. to avoid them just being buried by it as well. You know, it, it, it is, it's, it's um, a great analogy. I, I loved all your slides. I like the slides of the uh, the, the cat as well. Um, well, a couple of cat pictures in that one, actually, <laughs> that they got me for that. Uh, how wrong can you go, huh? Not at all. I'm a big fan. This works for me. Were there any questions? Um, yes, he's got a, a bunch of questions. Um, so uh, the, the first one I think uh, I will uh, go is, um, is uh, we, we're talking about, um, uh, I guess, the sort of the people and skills. You had your sort of your pyramid there of the of your different levels and that. And with things with uh, people and skills and everything, is uh, how, how do you kind of, how do you improve the skills of the team? So, I mean, it, it's kind of, uh, great having sort of the permission and that and you know if, if you go into a team you can help and you can mentor and so on but uh, you're not necessarily going to be a part of that team for for long uh, so how do you kind of get that team sort of to, to um, you know to, to improve their skills as they go along? I, I, it's going to depend on the team and the skills some things that we've tried uh, work quite well is we bring in show and tell sessions mm -hmm. so maybe on a Friday um, everybody contributes something. They'll talk about something they worked on in the week and how they got it better, you know, something they learned from it. And, and that's often an aha moment because it's real. It's, it's not just some learning out there. It's your, your project and your colleagues showing you how they actually were able to, you know, put a test on this that you never thought would be testable. And you're going, aha, right? So, mm -hmm. so show and tells are, are quite a nice in-team mechanism. If you've got the facilities to bring in outside consultants as, and workshop a few things that's useful to just check you know for the big shifts and mentoring is really important so if you can inject a little bit of fresh blood into the team mm -hmm. um and um do, do you sort of feel the some of the techniques like retrospectives as well uh will help so it's like a, a routine look back on how things have gone and looking at how things went badly as well as went well so you know you, you gave an example there of like you know I figured out how to unit test this kind of thing. So just just those kind of ideas with retrospectives. Do you agree with that so or not? Eva? I'd love to. I, I mean, mostly what I see out of retrospectives is quite it tends to be more people focused and less code focused. I'd actually love to hear from somebody who's able to do very code focused retrospectives because I haven't really seen it working. Um, and yeah. most people, and, and I, I guess I don't know, you know, the Scrum Master approach. You're often talking about team problems. So you're, it's often not the place we're talking about code problems. That team seems to move more into something like the SB2. Um, but yes, if you can have a code-focused retro, which says, you know, what what's what have we learned in the code? What went wrong? Uh, they're a lot more difficult to hold. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how you'd kind of necessarily go about doing that. I mean, what what would you suggest? Is it like finding a particular example which you've hit this week and just going through it? Just something as simple as that? Or uh, is there something more structured and more? Yeah, let's say I haven't really managed to pull off a, a code mm. level retrospective with the team without it just sort of wandering off into discussions of, of people, you know, and, right. and process. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of all the process stuff that goes on in some of the scrum things. Uh, we need to keep it fairly lean, in my view, and um, serving the team. Yeah, I like I like the sound of that. <laughs> That's good. Um, and what, what about things like, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, planning stuff uh, as well? So. I, I, I guess with with things like um, a code focus, uh, the, you, you're talking about there. 
if you want to be sort of improving some of your code there, there's going to be technical debt. There's going to be things that you 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 uh, run into that are going to be problems. Things like when you're talking about the Boy Scout rule, you know, sort of cleaning up as you go along and, and finding those things. But what about bigger tasks where you know this system over here is? We know it's a big ball of mud. I can't do anything until I've fixed it. And so you, you've got a specific technical debt problem. Do do you think it's a good idea to have um, have those planned as separate activities, or do you think it's better to try and fix things as you go along? So you know, should you focus on fixing the legacy stuff, or should you focus on working on features? And fixing the stuff as you go. What, what do you think? So, so I've got this kind of split that I try and aim for, where if, if you're, especially if you're going into a team, you kind of get an early chance to fix some big things because now you know you've got management support. You're kind of going into this. There's a, a focus on it, upgrading everything, that infrastructure type thing, and you're also able to say at that point often these are just the big things. But until they're cleared, we actually can't do anything. So you do sometimes have those that. So it's often bad architectural decisions. Mm. Um, and we, we just find that often it's been somebody with a, a, a title of architect and they want to put their stamp on how things will be done and the, the decisions that are made that cannot be justified ultimately, you know, and they just get in everybody's way, right? <laughs> I see you. Really. <laughs> you know yeah, the yeah. person I'm talking about. <laughs> too, much <laughs> of what, too much of what you're saying is resonating with me. This is a... <laughs> So yeah, I do have that section, and in some ways it contradicts what I said about having safety nets because sometimes it's so big you just got to do it. You know, you've got to yep. leap, honestly. So while you have management support <laughs> and if you have the time, you got to take certain big leaps and you just got to get them over with and then you can go back to stepwise. So, you know, they are both paths and they both have different roles to play. I, I have you made one question. solution for every single question about legacy? You know? uh -huh. <laughs> but those are the first strategies I've laid out. I tend to try and get the big ones done first. And then do yeah, that's a, that's a good way to mm -hmm. a good way to get things started and get the ball rolling, I guess. I have one more question. You, you talked about this uh, inversing the metric of lines of code, right? Uh, to, to make it how much do you lose? That kind of reminded me when I... Um, during my study, I had a side job, let's say, and I remember I, I removed some code and afterwards my boss told me, oh, that's not explicit enough. I, I think it was reading like uh, XML data through a more automated way with re uh, reflection over type, etc. And he said, no, we want to we want to keep this. Uh, we want to keep this explicit code. And even if it's more. And also we had uh, one comment in, in the chat, I think, where uh, someone said, um, you know, I'm not sure about the uh, exact constellation, but they didn't want to pay for, for tests being written. You know, and all this goes into the same, uh, it, it makes it really hard. And the, and the question here is, uh, do you have any advice on how, how you can convince your stakeholders to uh, yeah, actually believe, believe you and make a make a good decision instead of this purely I don't know dogmatic uh, uh, way of going. It, it, you know, it's really hard about it is that you, a team that's been working in sort of a bad way, you know, not not their their fault, right? But just battling along, they don't usually have the trust of management. You know, what management sees is a team that everything's slow. They don't understand. How much you know the team's battling against the code how much they're fighting at every step to get things done so you've got this mismatch of trust and and sometimes you have to bring in new blood almost you've got to bring in somebody who can make that happen so i say when you have their support you've got to do as much as you can at that moment and you've got to get some wins so that also management also sees oh it's all new we've got a faster database oh that's nice look it's performing better oh we can listen to these guys about what they want so, so sometimes some of these little upgrades, if you can get a, a boost, so it also pays back because you start getting trust from the management. So it is a psychological game because you're, you're trying to convince people to invest in something they can't see. And, and I mean, if they don't want to pay for tests, you know how they're going to feel about pair programming. <laughs> what? You want yeah. two people to do the job of one. No, it's not one. We need to talk. 
you know, you're going to get better solutions. Therefore, we'll get less code. Therefore, we'll have less maintenance and less bugs. You know, you, you've got to talk a longer game because luckily, one thing you can say about legacy systems, it's, it, you're not normally fighting budgets as much as people think you are. You know, startups are budget constrained. I understand why we do things dirty <laughs> in, in startups. There's no money, right? We can get something out. Although there's a whole talk there about why I don't think quick needs to be dirty. But that's another talk. Um, <laughs> strange. Hey, why do we say quick and dirty? But when you get to, to legacy systems, that system's there. It's a huge asset of the companies. They need it. Right? They assume a going concern here. So they have money. They have a team. These things are expensive. Surely they want to get the most out of their team and out of their code. So, you know, you're going to have to sell it. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> trust. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, I think what you said about trust is is a is a, a big factor in, in all that. Again, you know, if if the uh, stakeholders can see that you are actually delivering stuff, and then they can build build up the trust rather than just seeing that you're actually uh, slow, but you they don't realize that you're slow because you're constrained by these problems. And and so um, yeah, the, um, we just had a, a question pop in there actually about stakeholders, which is uh, probably relevant there. Is, uh, do you think if a stakeholder has experience in developing uh, or programming, that makes them a better uh, better person to lead the team, you know, to sort of to, to join in so you can actually point and say, explain the problems a little bit better rather than from a, a business perspective, I guess? Oh, well, you get both kinds, right? I mean, you get people who honestly do understand. They might have moved into management. They really understand. And you get mm -hmm. others who only understand enough to be dangerous. I can't answer that one for you. Yep, uh, yep. You, know, you know, you need to actually spend time uh, communicating with your stakeholders. You can't expect them to just understand. So you've got to turn this into something they understand. You've got to talk about the longer game, the value in the software, the fact that low defect rates are really important, and that we're trying to run, you know, bring those down, and that long term will give us a faster speed, we'll be able to respond faster to business. And you, you have to communicate this stuff. Otherwise, why would they know it? Why would they trust you to do it if you can't even tell them that's what you're trying to do? Yeah. Yeah. You're um, going to have to go and put a sales hat on at some time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and again, I think that kind of plays into the the, the idea of having the uh, the authority to make the changes. Uh, you know, mentioned that during the talk, and and it sort of plays into while you've kind of uh, got some buy-in, you know, having the authority of that. Um, do you have any tips for how you can push, how you can gain that authority almost from pushing it from the the, the team? Is it is it is it ma mainly just about getting your sales hat on, as you say, or have you got anything else you could sort of suggest for people? So the more open communication that you have, the better, right? So what I think happens is that we cover our, our problems. You know, we just feel like we're going to be blamed for this. So mm -hmm. a lot of teams will be, they won't tell everyone, this is why we have these problems. No one wants to speak about problems. And you get management as well. They're like, don't give me your problems, give me your solutions and all that kind of nonsense. So yeah. you're going to have to, you know, get through that. A lot of what we talk about in Agile is getting that openness. Where we actually all in this together. I mean, my success is yours, right? As, as business IT, what's the split? What's the difference? If, if you want these things and I can't deliver it, then we're all unsuccessful. So getting this open communication is really important. I, I think that the team has a lot more power than they think, but they always need to band together. They, they, they have to be a team vision, if you like. That, that's, that's so useful because a lot of people are sitting in the team and, you know, everybody in the team is feeling the same pain. You're going home at the end of the day and, and you're not feeling like you did a good job, you're feeling under pressure and, you know, it's, it's, it's very negative often being on a long running support project. It just feels like there's no benefit to it. So, you know, you're all feeling that. Talk about how, how, how could you, what would you like to learn that would help make your life better? Even if you just start at that level and you say, look, we're going to give, I don't know, 10% higher estimates on everything we do, which is probably okay anyway, right? Because you're probably always running into deadlines. A meta developer would estimate properly. <laughs> it's hard, right? You're always guessing. Yeah. And, and yes. It's hard. Okay, so just put a bit on it, build a little fat so that, first of all, you can actually hit the deadline. And maybe you could spend a little bit of time doing a spike, a test, an experiment to see if this could be better. 
And, you know, just getting that sense that actually we can make our lives better uh, could, could get the team onto a road, a road where they can improve things. So if, if you're one of the developers and you don't have a, a lot of authority, but you can motivate your team to say, listen, can, guys, can we try this? I mean, what's the harm in that? You know, start there. A lot of what I'm talking about, other than having the authority to do it, it's going to come from the team. I'm talking about the team fixing these things, you know, with a little bit of motivation, a little bit of reskilling and a, a little bit of input. But I'm not talking about taking it away from them. I'm talking about the team getting on board and, and walking this this walk do, do you so ever think it's i'm some, sorry i missed that just start you know yes <laughs> did, did you ever um think that it's um it, it's too late to change the habits of a team did, did you ever find that it's just mm -hmm. it's just hopeless that the team they don't want to know you know it's you, you, you perhaps you're brought in by management and the team are just like you know it's just rubbish <laughs> So that's the danger, coming in with the authority to make change. You first got to get over the resistance of people who feel they're going to be judged, which is why I say if you can get some early big wins and you can listen to the team, what are their problems, you'll probably get them on your side. I, don't know, I think devs love learning. Most of us love learning. Because we wouldn't be in this, we'd have dropped out long ago. So if you can harness that desire to learn, and there's a whole bunch of things, peer programming as well. You know, there's imposter syndrome. A lot of people just don't want to pair because they, it's almost like, what do they think of me? So you get to get over those things. You really do, and they're hard. I'm not saying these things are easier. I'm telling you to do it, but it's hard to do. I feel like something that, that has really helped me, and I remember uh, when I joined my previous team, and it, it was all a bit mm, more like mi mixed up. Uh, it, it was a very new team, and... and a lot of uncertainties. Uh, everyone was new in the job, mostly. And uh, for, for the first time, I think it was all very, mm, not, not very agile, but as soon as we went into, uh, you know, retrospectives where everyone kind of uh, warms up uh, from being a, a little ice block, let's say, uh, that was the moment when everything got a lot better. We also built relationships, you know, because this is also like soft skills is a very big factor also in this to kind of convince your colleagues, maybe even and, and initially some some people I even didn't like <laughs> in that team. And, and that also changed over, I mean, using those retrospectives. And I think that was a, that was a big win for the team. And yeah. we got a lot better through that. You have to refactor the people. <laughs> Yeah, you can those, respect well. them and the relationships you've got to make them all nice and healthy and then you can do good stuff i like that that's a nice way of uh, of looking at it refactoring the people just as much as refactoring the code yeah, um so a question. Question. yeah yes yeah exactly <laughs> there's a comment with the, the rewrite if it's the same people doing the rewrite as before if they haven't learned anything you'll get the same thing it makes so much same sense thing. when it's actually said out loud it's um it's great um I, I got a question about pair programming i mean you, i mean firstly the obvious question is do cats actually make good pair programmers um but more importantly um i guess uh, how do you how do you feel about the, the relationship between pair programming and uh, and code reviews for example you know did, did, is, is one better than the other or do they both sort of serve two different things or, or, or? Yeah, the ones afterwards and the others while you're doing it i've always mm. picked the one while you're doing it over the one afterwards you know code review is too late so you tell me there's 15 things you don't like so what <laughs> i'm finished <laughs> now <laughs> yep. fair point <laughs> you know i mean it, it might have its place you know but it's too late yeah you, you can i mean we, we've dropped a uh, so I can give you some of the things that we do. And um, if we have two seniors pairing, then they don't need an outside reviewer. If they're slightly more junior, we, we sort of specify who's. So the people who would be the reviewers and would say, yes, this is fine. They can basically, as long as they've paid, we're quite happy the code can go to production. If it's a more junior level than that, or actually junior, then absolutely they've still got to have the the whole pull request process, someone's got to approve what the work they've done. So even though they paid it, somebody else more senior still has to look at it if it's going to production. So that's production code, obviously. And you know, it's because, I mean, we're a software company, so we're pro providing systems to clients. You know, you, 
you know, and to have, uh, I, 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 oh gosh, I'm much too old to be pulled up on the carpet by clients anymore and yelled at because the the 17 year old made a mistake. <laughs> it's just not happening. Yeah. So we, we have you know, <laughs> mechanisms for that, but the best of them is the one that stops the error getting in in the first place. And that's the pair program. It's done enormous amounts for the quality of, of the deliverable and the reskilling and the sharing of domain knowledge. I mean, I'm just such a fan. And, and it's yep, not and 100% right. It's, sometimes you need a break away and you go and explore a bit on your own, but it's production code that we pair on. It's been interesting with the last year and everything. I mean, you, you mentioned it yourself about um, how pair programming has changed. It's gone much more remote. How do you feel that that has, or rather, do you think, do you feel that that's changed? I mean, I know you mentioned that, that you've got more space for you and your cat, um, but is um, do, do you think that's changed how you actually do pair programming? And is that for the better or the worse, do you reckon? You've you got to have good habits. Eh? I mean, you can have a dominant pair uh, who never gives over the keyboard, whether you're using a tool or whether you're using a physical keyboard. So um, we've, we've done workshops, you know, we, we try and bring people into what we consider healthy pairing, how it should work. We swap up the pairs, we, you know, so um, I find it actually with remote, we're, we're swapping pairs a lot more because if, you know, you used to, <laughs> In some of our teams, we used to have at the end of every sprint, everyone took their, their equipment under their arm and they moved desk, right? Because <laughs> they were going to pair with somebody else that week. And mm -hmm. there was a like, big shift that went on, you know. We didn't really have a hot desk set up. And, and now it's fine. I, I pop into a session and help on this, and then I pop into that session and we work on that. So it's actually a lot more fluid. Really enjoy it. I have one more question and that, that goes a bit more in the technical direction. You, you mentioned testing, you mentioned a couple of metrics also. Uh, what, what kind of uh, tools are you using or yeah, do, do you put it more general? Uh, what other tools are you using to kind of help with that uh, avoiding code to get a legacy? Is there any anything more specific like I'm not sure if I understood the. the yeah, like, like like calculate the metrics, let's say on CI server, yeah. and and what what other uh, techniques and. and... I think that, yeah, there's all these good principles. I mean, you, you should be doing code analysis. I think you know, just looking at the health of your code and the complexity ratings, and you know, I would recommend all that stuff's quite good. But but again, the team needs to. For me, it's a team level thing. Um, you must be careful that that doesn't end up in the hands of some manager who's now going, oh, you're making my system smaller. You know, this is bad. What I paid for all these lines of code, I want them. <laughs> so, so whatever it is that the team agrees are useful metrics, and that's very uh, environment dependent. But yes, you should be doing complexity analyses and looking at all of these things. There, there's also some tools that I really like that analyze your vault check-ins and tell you where your hotspots are, what is your busiest uh, code and, and that should be where you spend most of your time because we might touch something but we know we're never going to you know we're not going to go back there in years and well you know we said we'll keep it clean there and we'll do just enough but don't put as much of your heart and effort into that but the areas that are busy you know there's, there's parts of the system that are usually quite highly changing and you want to really put effort into that you want to spend more time talking about it designing it considering alternatives how do you get it better so if you can get yourself one of those tools that, that do analyses on the, the hotspots in your vault, that's also amazing. That, that was exactly my question. I just missed to phrase it correctly. Cool. Back <laughs> um, to you. We could give a plug to uh, Code as a Crime Scene by Adam Tornil here. <laughs> I love that. He's got some wonderful tools. Yeah, there's lots of them out there. It's, it's, tools have their place. You must definitely use what's available to you. Yeah, it's really useful. Um, Matt, do you have any any more questions? Um, I, I have one last one actually. I mean, um, one of your again, one of the levels of the the, the pyramid you showed there was um, um, I forgot what you said now. Tools and infra tools and infrastructure, I think it was. The base. Um, sorry. Yeah. The my base, base. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the industry moves so fast these days, you know. So you, you can have you know things change, new frameworks come out, new whatever, um, and 
how can you find a happy medium between keeping things up to date and not spending all your time chasing these new the, the next new next big thing yeah i think um you know, mostly I'm just talking about version upgrades that are non-breaking. I'm not saying you now swap from one framework to another. That's not mm -hmm. really what I mean. I just say keep up, you know, keep using the most up-to-date version of the framework you're in. You know, if you get a chance to move from, you know, .NET framework to .NET Core and you need to, then you go because you can get some benefits out of it. Uh, most of that's fairly non-breaking or there's quite good, you know, how-tos, you know, yeah, you know watch yeah, these yeah. things will break and you fix that and you move on. But it's very good for morale. There's something about working on the latest stuff. At least everyone feels that's okay. My skills are staying up to date. I'm not getting left behind. It's that sense of, you know, I'm a 10-year-old software. You know, it's going to look so bad on my CV. There's a whole bunch of things. You know, we, people, we care for ourselves too, right? So give the guys something nice to work on. Let them at least get the benefits of the, the latest IDEs and, and those things because they keep improving. Okay, they also keep getting more memory hungry and... Yeah, it's it's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, so it's just an interesting way to look at it of um, you know moving up to the latest version of something uh, as a boost to morale. I wouldn't have um, I wouldn't have thought of it like that, but yeah, you know it makes sense. It does matter. You see, I'm trying to say people matter, mm. uh, and it matters for things you can talk about security holes and things like that in older versions. You know, so you can you can make it matter to the business too, but. It should matter most to all of us as the people matter. People do matter. I, I think that's a very good closing note, maybe. For sure, of course. Again, there was there was a lot of wisdom in there. Uh, thanks again, Lorraine, for, for mm -hmm. being here, for uh, teaching us, entertaining us. And yeah, have a good day. Yeah, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. Thanks, everyone. Been great. Bye. Bye. Bye.